Hey everyone, it's Mike Andes, and today on the Landscape Business Course Podcast, we are going to be answering questions, doing some live Q&A, answering questions from the texting, as well as from the Facebook group. All right, so if you haven't already, make sure you text the number that's about to hop up on that screen. Text landscaping to the number that comes up on that screen, and that this is how you submit a question directly to me. I get them directly here, and then I'm able to bring them up on the show like I am today. So we're going to go through these questions. So here's the number. It is 855-575-1267. Text the word landscaping to that number, and this is how you can directly contact me. So for example, yesterday, I text a video link to everyone that was on on the texting group and I asked if they had any questions about it and these are the answers we got back. And so I'm gonna answer them directly here on the show, but please join the group by texting the number. All right, so the first question, it says, I know you get this a lot, but I am 19, I am a 19 year old and I am just getting my lawn care business started and I've been brainy, brainstorming so much on the best and effective way to market and get people knowing your business. So my question to you, Mike, is what is the best way to market or what are other ways of marketing? All right. So as you've heard me say in the past, if you don't have a lot of money when you're just getting started out, you have time. The best bang for your buck is going to be doing things that take your time and not your money. All right. So this, this is literally pounding the pavement. This is taking door hangers from door to door to door. And then the, the few days later, going and knocking on those doors, talking to those customers. And then if you have if you have money, I'd also then do an every door direct mail, EDDM campaign to that neighborhood. And then I would do a next door uh, local deal promotion to that neighborhood. And then I would do a Facebook ad targeting that neighborhood. All right. So that might be two or three neighborhoods that you have in a cluster. Maybe it's a thousand homes that you've really focused on in in your target market. But if you're just getting started, you want that tight route density and you want a lot of customers, that's what I would do. I would do uh, number one, door hangers on every single door by yourself, by hand, then I would knock on those doors and introduce yourself. Don't try to sell them anything. Just introduce yourself. Ask them if they ever would need anything for lawn care landscaping that you'd be uh, more than happy to give them an estimate. And then if you have the money to do so, I would keep co- keep going with that sequence. I would do the next door uh, local deal. I would do the uh, Facebook ad. I would do the every door direct mail flyer directly to them, a sales letter directly to their uh, house. Hit them five times, that thousand, two thousand home that you get, you're going to be targeting and you're going to get a ton of customers. All right. Everyone talks about like the fact that someone needs to see something five or six times for something to work. That's true, but it's even better if you can hit them in different, at different angles. So instead of doing door hangers every single time and then just seeing the same door hanger five times and they're uh, getting mad usually, instead of that, hit them with the door hanger, hit them with the personal uh, face interaction. Uh, hit them with the uh, sales letter in their in their uh, mailbox. Then hit them with a Facebook ad. Then hit them with the next door. Like so, there's so many different ways to hit someone. Hit them from different angles. And the more money you have, the more you can rely on digital media and pay per click. And the less money you have, you're going to need to depend more on hand delivery via door hangers and flyers, etc. Or actually talking to people, which is the best bang for your buck if you can get over the fear of selling and the fear of just talking to people. That's the best bang for your buck. Next thing, next question. Uh, Thank you for the tips. I just started my small company this season, DeKalb, Illinois, located located, two-man crew. I am making a commercial proposal. All right, so I'm just reading this as it's texted to me. So as most of you know, text language is sometimes a little weird. So let me read this as it's coming to me and see if we can parse out what's happening. All right, so it seems like DeKalb, Illinois is where this person's at. Two-man crew. I'm making a commercial proposal, 9.5 hours mowing, one full day spring cleanup, which will take 10 hours. Also, they're asking for fertilizer, weed control, bed edging, and more services. The way that I am making my numbers is six hours for mowing, including line trimming and blowing, times two guys, times 31 visits, then divided by the amount that I charge when it gives me a $56 per hour. Do you think it is fair? It, if you can help, thank you. All right, so the, the logic behind this is perfect is when someone asks you for a contract, whether it be just mowing or whether they want mowing and weeding and trimming bushes and cleanups and everything else, is break down each service, 
figure out how many hours you're going to spend at each service and multiply it by your hourly rate. That's the most accurate way to do services uh, in terms of pricing. You can do things by square footage. You can do things by uh, certain like rounding off certain things or like one day blocks or things like that. That's, that's one way to do it. But I'd highly recommend the best, most accurate way if you're going to get to the property and see the property is break down the services, break down the budget hours per service, per visit, multiply it out, figure out how, ma- how much is going to cost for an entire year, divide that by 12 if they're wanting a monthly rate. $56 per hour. He's a- it sounds like he's asking, if, do I think that's fair? Uh, for that size of a job, that's pretty good because there's no travel time. For residential mowing, we're looking at a higher rate because there's a lot more drive time. There's a lot more windshield, like there's less time on the job. For commercial, you're usually willing to take a little bit less. We don't, we don't change our rate, but because we don't want to change the P for P uh, and we, we want to really focus on the higher margin stuff. But in general, if you're going to break even, residential versus commercial, you can charge less per hour on the job, on commercial, because there is less drive time. You show up at the job, you spend, like you said, I think six hours. Yeah, six hours um, for two guys. There's not much drive time. So you, 56 would work. Like you're going to make money on that. So I think that would be sufficient without seeing the property and things like that and actually seeing if your hours are correct. Saying that $56 per hour on that size of a job, you're going to make decent money. <clears throat> Hey, Mike, I hope this is an appropriate place to ask a question. In regards to P4P, which for those of you who don't know, P4P stands pay for performance. It's the model we use to give a percentage of earnings to the employees as a way to pay them for performance instead of hourly. All right. In regards to P4P, I have not heard anyone go over this scenario. How do you handle P4P while training a new hire? The new hire, their self isn't really an issue, just having, just have them hourly during their training. But how do you handle the veteran employee when the new hire makes the job take longer and therefore the veteran employee is making less money? All right. First things first, when you switch to P4P, there is no hourly rate besides your base rate. Okay. So the person that's getting trained is still on P4P and hopefully they make more than P, than the base rate. Like if they can at least be efficient at blowing things off and trimming and push mowing, like the, the crew as a whole, the two of them together, even if the more veteran guys doing the driving and doing the zero turn, for example, they're still going to make good money. So we still really encourage our training crew that, hey, you can still make more than base rate. You can still break that base rate pay if you're efficient with the way that tra- you train. What that means is that Instead of your veteran person training the person on backing up the trailer and zero turn and all the other elements of the job, the first day they might literally be like, okay, there's the weed eater, there's the blower. That's all you're doing all day long. I'll do everything else as the veteran employee. And because that, those are easy, simple things that they can quickly show them within 20, 30 minutes, they're proficient enough to be able to work on the job. You know, blowing off is not difficult. And uh, so once they figured out those few things, they can actually be valuable to that crew and they can actually become, you know, make more than the base rate on P for P. So we don't give them an hourly, I don't like that concept. They might hit base pay if they're not doing very well or they're taking a long time, like you said, but we're still using P for P, they might hit base rate. That being said, the person who is training, the more veteran person, we do give a per hour bonus to whatever they make on P for P. So we give them a $4 per hour bonus if they're training somebody else And that is because, like you said, it's going to take longer and we do expect them to take time and train this other individual. What's great is then it's it's very easy for us to distinguish when someone's done training and we have to stop that hourly bonus paid to the veteran person is when they're killing it. The crew is consistently killing it on P4P and making substantially more than base rate. We know that there's no more need to be having someone to train them when they're doing, being so proficient. And so that's usually how we look at it. And what we found is that their training is much more efficient now because the veteran person is wanting to get work done quickly in addition to train the person and, and get them up to speed. So they're becoming more efficient at making sure, like I said, giving them small things that they can get, do really well, very quickly, and then slowly tacking on other tasks as they get proficient at certain things. So that way the, the route can still make money and they can still make more than base rate. So it's very, very good for us as the, as the, the business 
as well as for the veteran employee who's going to make all that extra money, as well as for the new hire who's going to incrementally learn little stages and make sure he's perfected each one and efficient at each one before he moves on. And the veteran employee wants that to happen so that way he's not spending all his first two days just teaching him all the different elements of the business when he could just slowly add those things in as needed. All right, next question. Again, this is all from texting. Again, you can text the number on the screen and you can get uh, direct access to me via these questions. All right, next question is, actually, yes, I have a question. So the reason they're answering like this is because, um, again, I was texting them, they text me back. So actually, yes, I have a question. I've used Lawn Pro for the past few years after your recommendation, but I'm seriously considering Jobber. Lawn Pro has more options and is cheaper, but it is good, not great. Jobber has less functions, but seems better. Question is, I've grown to love the texting function within Lawn Pro because I can blast text a large group of my homeowners, but Jobber doesn't have that capability. What text options have you guys used? Example, updates about upcoming services or upselling cleanups, et cetera, as opposed to just invoice and service client and service text. All right. So first of all, we have not used text a whole lot. The reason for that is because we wanted to streamline which mode of communication we are going to use. We are still playing with text. Uh, and the reason for that is mostly due to our target consumer being older. Secondly, it's more important, and that is really making sure that all of our communication is coming from one stream because as we have hundreds and thousands of customers that we're dealing with, and now at the franchise, they're from all over the country, we want to make sure we don't lose anything in the communication trail. And so we're making sure that we really button down the communication that we get every single email answered. We don't ever miss a voicemail. We never miss a phone call. Like that's what we're trying to do. So we mostly use email. Uh, and also it's, it's more, tra it's usually goes, you can go back into a text or an email usually in the inbox easier and find things for the customer. So for example, they forget something like a link you sent them for an invoice or a link you sent them for an estimate or something like that. It's usually easier to search and find on their inbox and their email. That being said, uh, when it comes to Lawn Pro versus Jobber, that is a perfect way of saying it. Lawn Pro has more options and it's cheaper, but it's good. It's not really that great. It's due to the fact that it is a smaller software system. It's very, very cost effective. Jobber is very user friendly and it, but it has less of the automations it has less of some of the customized custom uh, customizations it has less of some of the features that you might want to use for customizing certain certain things so that's what i would say is a perfect synopsis of lawn pro versus jobber but jobber is much more user friendly and more dependable but lawn pro does have some cool features with automations texting and it's very very cheap um, but yeah in terms of text messaging I'm not against it. We've played a lot with it from the sales aspect in terms of getting people as a lead. And that has been um, a lower conversion ratio than we've seen on phone. And that, again, is usually people less likely to pick up a text message initially to initiate sales. They're, what we have seen a good conversion on is text messages used to uh, connect and communicate with the business once they become a customer. So we've seen that w used well, but the email we've still stuck to mostly due to the fact that we want to keep everything organized coming from one direction instead of having too many lines of communication because we don't want them to have like access to us through the client portal and then the face, uh, our Facebook page and then email and then phone and then our guys out in the, in the, out in the field. We want it like as much as possible keeping things coming through email uh, for the sake of just making sure we we stay on top of everything uh, very easily. All right, next question. Hi, Mike. I own and operate a medium-sized commercial landscape maintenance company. I'm interested in your landscape business course, but really want to know more about P4P. Is that covered in the course? Thanks. Chad in Arizona. So uh, this is a question about landscape business course. So yes, landscapebusinesscourse.com. The updated uh, course has about 17 hours worth of video from the last conference, and that has P for P and how he explains everything goes to numbers and all of that. So you can check that out on landscapebusinesscourse.com. It's at the very bottom module of the page. All right, next question. $300,000 last year in revenue. I'm using the free Lawn Pro with QuickBooks and the free LMN budgeting. I do 100% maintenance and that's how I would like to keep it as I scale to 1 million. I feel pricing is so much easier to get correct. Not saying I'm right, but I don't have enough knowledge at 20 years old to, to price in install. 
but I will, I, I have all my pricing down for maintenance work. So yes, a hundred percent. Um, this is not so much of a question, but I agree with the concept of sticking with maintenance before you get into installing the pricing. Yes, it's easier. You need less equipment. If you go back to my last video, I talk a lot about this, this concept of when you're getting started, sticking with maintenance, lower barrier to entry. Uh, you can charge higher pricing to a residential small customer than the big commercial projects, uh, less equipment is involved, less skilled labor, etc. So definitely when you're first getting started, that's my recommendation is sticking with the maintenance. And then if you want down the road, you can scale into large commercial projects for maintenance or for installations and project based work. Last question here from the texting app. We are a small company planning to hit 575,000 to 600,000 in gross sales this year. What should we plan on being our reality in regards to salesperson, offices manager, and project manager? Currently, I'm the estimator, salesperson, company administrator, office manager, etc. I am planning on training a part-time office assistant for this year and taking the role of sales estimator, project manager. Should I be delegating any part of that to one of my field guys who it would who is capable? Thank you, Jeremy from Cable Bros Outdoors. All right, so uh, doing about 600,000 revenue this coming year. Sounds like probably, I would imagine last year, probably like 400,000 and really probably growing, I'm assuming, based upon this text. Uh, and the owner's asking like, what's my role? What should I be focusing on? This is my biggest thing with P4P is you should not have to be the person out in the field in terms of a project manager. P4P should make it where you can focus more on the upfront sales, have the project management video that goes to your, to your crew, and then they're able to implement the, install the work if you're doing project-based work. Uh, and so if you have project managers, I'd highly recommend so that you don't have to be there, so that you don't have to be on the site. Number one fastest implementation, project management videos. If you don't know what that is, Jeremy, go to the Facebook group. Several people last year implemented it after the conference, and it is an absolute game changer. It will instantly change your business and not make you have to go back to projects. And as long as you're not a micromanager and you're okay with delegation, like it sounds like you are because you're asking about delegation, project management videos will save you so much time as an owner, and it will put a lot more accountability on your crew. Um, at $600,000 in in annual revenue, you definitely want someone in the office. Uh, and I would say you should be focusing on estimating sales hiring. That's like what you should start focusing on. If you want to go from 600,000 to a million plus, that's going to be what you need to focus on. And so delegating everything outside of that is very important. That's There's a reason why we have command center for the franchisees. It's so that they can scale and they don't have to worry about getting the office person to answer their phones and send their estimates and all that sort of thing. And this is, it's, this is you can afford it. At 600,000, you can afford that. I would not go hire your salesperson. I would stay the salesperson as the owner and that's because that is the most important thing in your business right now. So keep your hands on that. Once you pass a million in revenue and if you want to continually get out of the day-to-day -day operations, that's when you can go hire an estimator or a salesperson. But for now, you should focus on keeping the sales position, keeping the estimator role and delegating out the office administration and then making sure that you have a system in place like P4P that is going to allow project management to be taken off your plate as well, as well as customer uh, like quality control and things. P4P, the system behind that should run run all of that for you. All right, so that's all the questions from there. Now I'm going to jump over to the Landscape Business Course Facebook group and see if there's any questions that came in. All right, there's a couple popped in. Okay, so I just posted right before hopping on today, I just posted a question asking for any uh, Q&A questions they want answered. Let's see if there's, there's, look like there's a few that popped in. So let's go ahead and answer those. First one from Carlos Rodriguez. How do you recommend getting into pay per click? I've spent about five hundred dollars with about six hundred, or sorry, I've spent about six hundred, five hundred dollars with about sixty clicks, but only two calls. What is your advice there? So first thing I would say is that uh, five hundred dollars with six, sixty clicks is bad. Uh, you're paying almost ten dollars per click, so something's wrong with your creative or, and, and just your text, because this is a Google AdWord. And the reason I know that is because Carlos then attached a picture, which thank you for doing that, uh, Carlos. So uh, in this picture, it says, uh, I, "I can show this to you." I'm gonna. So I, in the, if you're watching the video of this, you're gonna be able to see. I'm gonna go ahead and put the picture of of what Carlos's ad looks like. All right, so you should see that now. And then here's the second one. There. All right, so this is what I would say, is that 
based upon, so Carlos says the first ad seems to perform better and the second one more expensive per click. All right, so the reason this is happening, I can tell you right off the bat what was wrong with these ads. And that is when people are searching in your local area, you want, like in your ad, uh, Carlos, your second one especially, the reason it's doing, not doing very well is you're just doing keywords. You just have a bunch of keywords. You have yard cleanup, shrub trimming and mulching, yard cleanup, sod installation, plant installation, mulch installation, lawn service, lawn, lawn mowing, gardening, edging, shrub. Like you just, you just listed keywords. Keywords are a part of the ad backend. It's not part of the creative that's going to the customer. Let Google put, the, you're paying Google to put this in front of people. You don't need good keywords to get Google to put this in front of people. You're paying them to do this. So don't worry about keywords. Worry about what the customer is going to see. That means you need to have a call to action and you need to have your name of your company in that title. All right, so what we find really useful is doing things around getting an estimate within 24 hours, something about professionalism, something about uh, something that makes you stand out. Like whatever you really are the uh, go-to in your market about, whatever is your unique selling proposition should be in that title with the name of your business because when people click on that, they want to be going to a business's website. And so if you just have a bunch of keywords and don't tell like what you're what the name of your company is, they don't think that you, they should be clicking on you. They're looking for a company because they just typed in lawn care service. They want to see a name of a company. So what I'd recommend, in my opinion, is doing Rodriguez Landscaping and put call today and get an estimate today. Something like that. Like, and then in the text portion, don't just do keywords. Say something that's valuable to the customer about curb appeal or about the making sure it's relevant to their area. So if you're targeting a certain area, say something like, like say for example, if you're t targeting in uh, San Antonio, Texas, say rated number one landscaper in San Antonio, Te San Antonio Texas, or um, highest reviewed landscaping company in San Antonio, Texas, whatever it is, but don't just put a bunch of keywords. Keywords are used for SEO and for Google optimization for search. It's not used for Google ads. All right, Dom Lamscaper Moore asked, how do you look at the Profit First idea? So Profit First is an idea, a book that Michael McCallowitz wrote. I've talked about this before. I like the idea. If you're not very uh, disciplined with your finances and when you see money in the bank, you feel like you can spend it, that, that's a horrible thing to do. And so we do not use Profit First at Augusta Lawn Care. And for the franchisees, I know a couple of them do because they know that they do have struggle with financial discipline. So I think Profit First is a disciplinary action that you use to make sure that the finances of your business are tightened up. We don't use it because we do not spend money if we do not need to. Like we are focused on profit and like distributions to the employees or to the, the owners of the business. And so we are not really looking at profit first in terms of like break. So break, basically profit first breaks apart as revenue comes in and income comes into your accounts. You break it into like operations and then like profit and then uh, certain elements of your business, like five different bank accounts or whatever. Um, we don't do that because if we want to make an acquisition, I want to have, have the cash in the bank and be able to throw the money at the acquisition. So when we bought a company last winter, we had the cash, we took it, we, we sold. I didn't wait for that one account to get to the certain level where we could afford it, which might have been another two years, and then go out and purchase. Like we went... We, we had the discipline to know that we're going to have the money in the bank. And we're going to go make the, the purchase. And we know that every single month we're going to be profitable so we don't need to worry about cash flow. All right. Denny Pham asks, what are your thoughts working with builders? Pros and cons. Would you price their installs differently than residential? Um, yeah. Builders are sometimes difficult to work with. So this is in concerns to design build. Sometimes they don't want to pay their 50% down because they don't get paid till the end of the job or they don't get a draw at, to the homeowner until afterwards. And so sometimes working with a builder, it's sometimes they are, they're less likely to want to pay up front, like a 50% down, a deposit. Those are the, usually the cons. The pros are that they understand that you're a business owner. They're less likely to be watching over your, uh, over your shoulder and everything. They just want the work done. They're focused on the contract. They're focused on getting the, the job as a whole finished. You're just doing a piece of that. And they're usually easier to work with because they're used to working with business owners and they're used to working with contractors. So that's sometimes easier. Would we price it differently? Not differently on our side. We might have a little bit less admin time baked into the estimate if it's a big install project, just because there is less 
talking with the customer, making sure they feel comfortable, asking them questions. Usually the contractor's like, hey, do what's best. We trust you. Like, figure out the planting, figure out what looks best and go for it. Colton Kendall asks, okay, there's too many questions here. I'm not gonna be able to get to them all. Colton Kendall asks, is EDDM overrated? What's the best process to create postcards and send them out? Uh, is every door direct mail overrated? No, it's all about how you use it. It's great targeting. If you're going after specific neighborhoods, just just blanket entire county is not the best use of every door direct mail. It's not overrated if you use it correctly. We encourage the franchisees to use it and they just got two postcard, two door hangers and a flyer that could be used for every door direct mail uh, because it still works if you're targeting certain neighborhoods. If you're just gonna canvas an entire county, not really worth it. Paul West, do you offer a bonus for employees who come back in the spring after if they are laid off for the winter? I've ne never laid off, laid employees off. I think it would free up my time to focus on business during the office off season. How can I keep them motivated other than maybe throwing them a $500 or so bonus? Thanks. So Paul, with P4P, our, we know that our crew coming back is going to make substantially more money per, per hour than if they went somewhere else or if they stayed at the jobs that they take during the winter. And so by having that P for P system where they can make more money, they want to come back and they're looking forward to it. So this past winter, we were fortunate enough to all the people that we did lay off, they all came back. And that's because they can't go find another job in the industry for the same pay. So having something like P for P where they're paid based upon their performance, when they perform high, they can make more than if they went and found another job. So they want to come back. All right, another question in here from Sean Hancock. But if you're not doing P4P, something like a $500 bonus might be good to get them to come back, but I want them to have that same level of enthusiasm the whole year. I don't want them just to come back, show up for three weeks, and then bounce after they get their $500 bonus. Sean Hancock asks, we run a, f a tree business and have real trouble finding experienced staff. We pay more than the going rate and have a good staff oriented business. Just don't seem to be anyone around. We are training guys in house, but that obviously takes time. All right, Sean. So a couple things I would say. Number one, try to implement something like P4P where people can make not just a little bit more or good pay. Uh, that, that's a little bit more than the going rate. Make it where like if they're performing high, they can make 10 dollars more per hour or five dollars more per hour, not just like a dollar or two. So P4P is going to help a lot with this. However, let's take that off the table. I would then say try to do a, a career fair. I would say uh, make it a, a, a text, like a decal on all of your trucks that say you're looking, for, uh, you're looking to hire team members. I would get just as fanatical about hiring and attracting talent as you are about attracting new leads. So like marketing for this is an important part. So like if, if, your, if your bottleneck to growth is finding new people, you should be literally marketing to find good people. You should be sending out newsletters to your customers. You should be posting on your Facebook page. You should be like doing everything you possibly can. You should be finding a hiring agency locally, like looking at a temp agency as a, a way to bring in people and then funneling them through. You might have to go through 10 or 20 of them and finding someone that's good. So like if, if, if hiring and finding good people is your bottleneck, you got to get very fanatical about it. I feel like some people, they, they say that they, that's their bottleneck. They say that they have a problem with it and then they treat it like it's, you know, a toothache. They just kind of like shugger it off. Uh, when it's like something they need to get really serious about, spend some money on, spend time on, have a career fair where you go out and you canvas and you get, you know, 50 people to show up and then have food there and you have a, a slide showing the whole bit. You can find it at a, a go to a credit union, ask for a free room, tell them you're gonna have a food sh uh, a, a, a show uh, or a career fair. Go to a library, they'll let you have a career fair usually for free in a room. So these are things you gotta think about. It takes time, energy, money. Uh, but if it's actually the bottleneck to your business, you'll get serious about it. But P for P, where they, can, they have the opportunity, the A players have an opportunity to make quite a bit more money, that will really help. Kevin asks, what's your thoughts on Nextdoor app? My thoughts on the Nextdoor app is this, and that is it's a great tool if it's not saturated in your market. For example, what I mean by that is in our area, there's not a lot of people advertising on it because there's a new local deals part of the Nextdoor app where you can, you can advertise. Uh, what I don't like about it, you can only advertise within 10 miles of your address. So if your address is here, but then you have 
all your service, like all your customers are in a different locale, like further than 10 miles away from you, you can't actually even advertise in the area. Like they will not let you do that. So that's, that's kind of lame. Um, what else I don't like about it is it forces you to do a deal, like a discount of some sort in terms of the local deal that you offer. Great penetration, great if, if in your market there's people not a lot of people advertising on it using local deals that's the name of the product that you can use uh, then it might be great in terms of cost per click we've seen really good numbers but there's also some places where it's like Google Ads where you have several people just even several people marketing on it using local deals and it drives the price way up until last year only big companies like Angie's List Home Home Advisor. Uh, Home Depot and a few others were allowed to advertise on Nextdoor. It just opened up to where small businesses can. So it's definitely worth trying out. Um, and it's definitely something we're playing with a lot. What I love about it, the best thing about it, is the ability to target individual neighborhoods. You pair that up where you're targeting individual neighborhoods with every door direct mail, door hangers, and knocking on their door. And then you pair that with a Nextdoor local ad that just is targeting the people in that neighborhood. Oh my goodness, great conversions. So it's really, I like Nextdoor as a way to connect uh, the Every Door Direct Mail campaigns and door hangers with something else online because it's so targeted to their neighborhood. That being said, take off local deals and the ad product. Nextdoor is a great way to connect with your local market in terms of just hearing about what's happening in the neighborhood. Here, there, you definitely will get leads. So if you're small, if you're just you know, one, two, three employees, it's a great place to actually find leads for free of people asking for landscaping, landscaping, asking who would be a good landscaper and you just can directly message them. You can directly contact them right through the app, completely free. So I'd highly recommend it if you're small, definitely can get free leads there. If you're larger and you're willing to pay for it, the local deals product is definitely worth investigating. Next question, oh, they're still rolling in here. Um, next question that's coming is, what would be the one thing about Augusta Lawn Care that is best? Oh, I see. Okay. What is the, okay. So in terms of Augusta Lawn Care, the franchise, um, mm, that's a tough question. So if I was to say right now, the best thing about being a franchisee for Augusta Lawn Care, the best advantage would probably be the command center, getting all your calls answered, not having to hire an office staff, not needing to build an office or have computers, things like that as you grow. Uh, our goal with command center is to save the franchisee more money using command center than their monthly fees. Like just command center, not taking into account the fact that the franchise offers the website and training and the marketing material and all that. Just command center, we wanna save the franchisee more on the command center and having that available, then they had to have their own office staff, heat a facility, rent a facility, all the stuff that goes into that. Um, in the future, if you ask me this question about three months, I'd probably say P4P system, the software that we're building is going to be the best thing about it because we're not charging the franchisees any more for it. And it's going to allow their, their, uh, employees to punch in and out on the app, get direct text messages, exactly how much they made the day before in terms of pay for performance and the reporting on that. It's going to be great. So that would probably be what I would say. So. That's what I would say for Augusta Lawn Care franchisees. There's more questions rolling in. I'm going to go ahead and cut it off because we are getting a little bit long. I'll answer a couple more of these and then delete it off the app because or off the group because they just keep rolling in. So thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. Make sure you text us at the number that's been coming up on the screen, and you can ask me questions. I directly will answer you those uh, as soon as I possibly can. And thank you so much for watching. Take care, everyone.